one greeting that we've shared. You may be familiar with it. It starts with me saying, Christ is risen, and there's a response to it. He is risen indeed. indeed. Oh, so you know this. Wonderful. Friends, on this beautiful, not quite spring Easter morning, Christ is risen. He is risen risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Thanks be to God. Friends, I would invite you to take just a moment and greet those who are nearby you. Happy Easter. Good morning. He is risen. Whatever works for you, say good morning. After you've uh, said good morning, you can be seated. Not like the old days where we're going to stand the whole time, so you're, you're good here. So friends, welcome to Easter morning at St. Paul's United Methodist Church. Uh, for those of you who may not have met me, and I realize that that is probably um, some of you, uh, I'm J.T. Greenleaf. This is my first Easter with you, at having just started in July, and it is a joy uh, to celebrate this day with you as it has been to celebrate the joy of um, the season of Lent together. And I look forward to all the, the, the gifts and the grace that uh, God pours out for us in our time together this morning. That's that. Well, good morning. For those who don't know me, my name is Todd Vosper. I'm a lay pastor here at the church, and thank you so much for being here with us this morning on this Easter day. We have, um, well, especially for you online, if you're joining us here, we appreciate you being there with us as well. There's a link on our homepage. You can uh, click and let us know that you're here. Oh, we would greatly appreciate uh, knowing you're out there, but thanks for showing up. Uh, We have just a few announcements. Uh, We play announcements on the big screen, and if you missed those, you can sit and listen uh, to the postlude here and catch up on all those things. But we have a couple of things. There is no second cup with Pastor JT today because we have a second service rolling, and uh, we'll be pretty busy there, so we get a day off. And uh, then we also, just a reminder for the men, there's a men's breakfast coming up on uh, next Saturday morning. We're going to do breakfast burritos, so I'm not cooking, so it's a good, sun, uh, good Saturday morning to come. And then we also have our blood drive that we have talked about uh, that will be May 8th uh, here on the campus, so please keep that uh, in mind as well. And I think that's all I have, so I we're going to hand it. off and do some singing, I believe. Yep. So please rise as you're able, and we will sing our first hymn. The words will be on the screen, but you can see it'll be number 304 in the red hymnal as well. Please be seated.
I'd like to invite you into our threshold moment this morning. Mark's account of the resurrection is the shortest and probably the most troubling. We wonder what happened to these women. So far, the most stalwart of Jesus' disciples now seemingly too afraid to tell anyone. But perhaps Mark's ending is meant to shatter the familiar comfort of the Easter story and remind us of the utter impossibility of resurrection and the enormity of what these women are trying to grasp. Do we even grasp it today ourselves? As we listen to Mark's gospel this morning, consider this core question. Have you ever been too afraid to speak? Now let's con uh, continue with our call to worship this morning. I'll lead with the white, uh, words in white font and please respond in yellow. Rejoice, Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen indeed. This is God's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Rejoice, Jesus is risen. Jesus is risen indeed. And now we'll rise again as we're able, please, and we'll sing our next hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today, verses 1, 2, and 4. Uh, the words will be on the screen and also in the red hymnal number 302. Now this morning, since we don't have a lot of littles running around, we're going to move past our time with all God's children into the pastoral prayer. But I wanted to remind those parents with kids that it's a little messy outside, but we are still gonna have that Easter egg hunt. It'll be in the social hall at 940, so keep your eyes open for that. Now let's please join together in an attitude of prayer enabled by the Holy Spirit. The words will be on the screen. Resurrection God. You love us so completely that you willingly submitted to a human life and death. 
and in doing so, shattered the bonds of death and sin forever. You have raised us to new life in your Son, Jesus. Open our lips to proclaim the good news of your salvation to all the world, and through your Spirit, may we reflect your renewal of creation in our pursuit of justice, love, and peace for all. Amen. And we lift all these prayers together in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Because of the Sabbath, there was no time to prepare the body of Jesus for burial. So early in the morning on the first day of the week, the women went to the tomb. When they got there, the large stone blocking the entrance had been rolled away. An angel sat upon it, and he said, Why do you look for the living in a place of the dead? He is not here. He has risen just as he said. Hurry and tell the disciples he is alive. When they realized what the angel had said, they were overcome with joy. They ran as fast as they could to share the news, the words ringing in their ears. He is alive. He is alive. He is alive.
When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He's not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Let the church hear what the Spirit is saying. Friends, I would invite you to pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So during this season of Lent, these last several weeks, it, the, the scriptures, as they, they, they rolled out before us, gave us opportunities to ask different questions. Okay? There's so much about Lent and so much about the Easter season that seems familiar, and it's easy to just kind of dial it in. You know, oh yeah, this is that season, we're sacrificing things, and we get to the end of it, and there's a payoff because Jesus has risen from the grave. And we just kind of go about our day. But the season of Lent is an opportunity for us to always dig a little bit deeper in our life and in our faith, to ask a different set of questions. And so even though this is, I think that this is something like my, it might be my 30th Easter sermon, um, I had a question this week. How did we ever get here? How did we ever get to the place that 2,000 years later, we would still be proclaiming the risen Christ and the empty tomb. Because especially as you look at Mark's gospel, as, as Todd was saying earlier, it didn't start out so well. The women who came to the tomb and they were told by, well, let, let's just call this person who showed up in white, let's call them an angel. Let's call them, not in the, the, the wings thing, but angel in the scriptural sense is that God was present in a way, okay, that was significant. So God shows up in the empty tomb and says, Jesus isn't here. It's exactly like he said, but go ahead, tell the others, go to Galilee, and he'll see you there. Sounds good. But put yourself in the position of these women. Jesus was dead. I mean, Jesus was dead, D-E-D, -E -D, dead. He was in the tomb. The stone had been rolled across. Now what? Well, they did the only thing that seemed right, is they were going to prepare him for burial because as they were preparing for the Sabbath and the sun was going down, they didn't have time to do it. So they were coming in to backfill what they had, would have done on Friday. And boy, were they in for a surprise. So what do you do with that surprise? All of a sudden, before you, there is a, a witness and a reality that's unfolding that's unlike anything you have ever heard of, let alone experienced in your life. That Christ is risen. That Christ is alive. And they, this, this odd mix of terror and amazement, do they run off and tell? Do they, run, do they follow the instructions? No, they don't. They said nothing to anybody. But then in the short ending of Mark's gospel, 
all of a sudden it's they're just going off and the gospel's being propagated. So how do you get from terror and amazement and saying nothing to all of a sudden the gospel is being proclaimed across the world as if nothing ever happened, as if it ha all happened according to plan? How in the world did we ever get here? Thankfully, for much of our understanding, the pieces get filled in by Matthew and Luke and John. We hear in Matthew, Luke, and John, we hear a number of Easter stories, a number of post-resurrection stories that are very interesting and unique. Now, some of the people came to it pretty quickly. The, there's the one telling of the story where Peter and John hear what the women have said because in that telling of the story, the women did go back and tell Peter and John that they had seen Christ. They run back to the tomb. Peter gets there first, but John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, actually goes in. Peter's a little bit skeptical, but John is all in. Then we get later in the day with Thomas. Remember doubting Thomas? Thomas who said, I'm not going to believe unless I can see it for myself. Well, and I think doubting, we'll, we'll talk about this another Easter, but I don't think that doubting Thomas is an accurate way to describe it because it's not so much that he doubted, he just wanted the same experience that everybody else had had. They got to see Jesus. They got to hear him speak. And they believed because they had that moment. And John only wanted to know Christ present in the same way that they did. Then there's the story that's told in Luke's gospel about later in the day when Cleopas and his unnamed friend, who were part of the larger circle of Jesus' uh, following, they knew the whole story. They had walked with him. They had heard the teaching. They had, they had known it all. They had known and they had heard the story about his passion. They had even heard the story of how the women had came, come back and witnessed that Jesus had risen. And they knew that Peter and John had, had gone and seen that Jesus was risen. But it didn't seem to have an effect on them. Even though they knew the whole story, they were going home because they thought that all was lost. Everybody comes to the story of resurrection. Everybody comes to a place of understanding of resurrection on their own. There's no one size fits all in this. There's no light switch that you turn on and suddenly you get it. Coming to, the, coming to terms with this idea of the risen Christ and the empty tomb, which is still 2,000 years later, and especially with our understanding of medicine and science, seems more fantastical than it ever has before. And yet, having been a philosophy minor, I understand that truth endures that sooner or later, over time, truth will out, as the saying goes. This faith, this trust, this hope, this discipleship, this life, if it was a sham or if it was a, you know, somebody's con job, it doesn't last this long. It doesn't change the world in the way that Christian discipleship has changed the world. If it's a sham... So we come today and we proclaim a Christ that is risen from the grave, not because it's 2,000 years of tradition, but because in our life, in our heart, somehow, some way, we are on that path of having this reality, this truth, this hope, making a difference in an ongoing way in our life and in how we see the world. And we all come to it differently. And that's okay. Because what we have in this early church, what we have in this breadth of gospel story, is we get the distinctive ways that each of the disciples understood, experienced this reality, and how it shaped their life, their faith, their relationships with God and everybody else. And each one of these stories becomes one tile in this amazing, beautiful mosaic that we, in our own life, in our own faith, in our own understanding, 
are adding to this story, this story of redemption, this story of transfer, transformation, this story of new life. Like many of you, I've been walking this path of faith for a really long time. I don't remember a time in my life where in some way, shape, or form, I wasn't walking this path, where I wasn't being shaped by a church community. Now, I look back, and I am a quantum leap from where I started, as I'm sure many of you are. And like you, in, in my faith journey, there have been big steps, a few really big steps, but mostly just kind of small, moderate steps. Most of those steps, steps, I'm thankful to say, have moved me closer to this understanding, but in all honesty, some of the steps have taken me away. But it's all part of this journey because on every step of the way, grace is there. Grace is there to strengthen our understanding of what it is we're experiencing Grace is there and wisdom is there to help us make sense of what it actually means to us. It's one thing to know what the gospel story says. We know the stories of Jesus. We know the teaching. What it says is the easy part. What it means and what it means for us, that takes a little doing. That takes a little work on our part. We need to be willing to ask questions. We need to be willing to dig a little bit deeper. We need to be willing to open up our life and what we think we understand to deeper possibilities. And that's what we do. That's what we do every day. Whether you're in this space on a Sunday or somewhere else or watching online in real time on Sunday morning, or catching it later in the week, or catching it later, later, maybe binge-watching all of the worship services for Lent and catching them. I mean, hey, you, you, know, you do you, however you do this, but the, the important thing is, is doing this work of gaining deeper understanding, of learning new things, asking different questions about what this story is and its significance for us and for the world. We start in the same place, that moment when Christ finds us. Whenever, wherever, however, we all have our own stories of that moment when Christ finds us. And sooner or later, we end up here at the empty tomb and looking inside and going, what am I seeing? What is it that I'm seeing? And then, okay, now what do I do with this? This story, this hope, this witness of a Christ who is risen from the grave, now what? And so we continue to ask questions. We dig through Scripture. We become part of a community of faith where we can, where we can learn from one another and see the face of God um, in each other, where we can learn the parts of God's stories that are parallel, adjacent to ours, and we add our story to theirs, and they add their story to us. And in this great sharing we learn more. In this great sharing, we grow more. And we realize that we do, in fact, have a story to tell. We have a story of new life. We have a story of resurrection. We have a story of restoration. We have a story of how our lives have been transformed by this gift and this promise of God this expression of grace that is poured out. We have a story. You have a story. And your story is unique. There is no one that is living now, has ever lived, or will ever live that can tell your story. And it leaves us with the question, if you don't tell your story, 
If you don't bear witness in the way that you live and love the story of the grace that you have received, then who will? Who will tell that story? Who will be touched and moved by the story that you share and live with them? Because I got, I got news for you. There are people that you will see out there, which is where we need to be telling our story a lot. There are people that you see out there. You see them in your school classrooms. You see them at work. You see them everywhere you go that are looking for exactly what you have. They are searching for exactly what you have been found. They are searching for that gift that you have already received. And if you don't tell your story, then we run the risk of, 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 of missing people. Because there are people who are searching for healing in their life, who have, who have been, been um, torn up, chewed up, spit out by life and by the world. They're just looking to be healed. They're looking to know that they're not alone. You see people out there that are searching for a community um, in which to belong because they have been pushed out of or have chosen to step away from communities that had done them harm in the past. There are people that you see every day that are looking for what you have found in your life, in your faith, in your, your relationships within this unique community of faith. And if you don't show them the way, if you don't show them the way here, if you don't walk with them in their search, then the strong likelihood is that they may continue to be lost, broken, alone. See, this story that we celebrate, I mean, Easter's wonderful. I remember many of the Easter's I've experienced in this role. But each one is different. In the many years of, of celebrating this moment, the more, I, the more I experience this, the more that I preach these texts, the more that the grace gets deeper and deeper inside me, the more I realize that while this day is special and we, this is the cor a cornerstone piece of our faith, the real strength and the real power like it was in the, the, the stories where they told this fantastical story of new life. The real power of the story happens out there where we extend ourselves in self-giving love in the same way that Christ did for us. And we take this life-changing, life-altering, life-giving hope of a re resurrected Christ with us. So friends, I'll ask or I'll say it again. Christ is risen. Is risen Christ is risen. He is risen and Christ again and still and always is risen. Amen. Friends, we respond to this gift, this gift of hope, with all that we have, with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our witness, and our service. This is an act of faith. This is an act of confidence. And as we have been given, now we give back.
I would invite the ushers to come forward to receive this morning's gifts, tithes, and offerings.
Dear God, we thank you so much for this opportunity to give back some of what you have so graciously provided. We ask your spirit to steward and multiply these gifts that we as your Easter people may take this message of hope forward to a world that so desperately seeks it. We lift these prayers in the name of your risen son, Jesus Christ. Amen. And now please remain standing for our final hymn. The words will be on the screen. It's also number 327 in the red hymnal. you to turn and face the world. And I've been thinking all week about this idea of storytelling, and oddly enough, it's a Christmas hymn that came to mind. You may know it. We have a story to tell to the nations. So we're going we're gonna to shift it a little bit, and I'm going to do it this way. You, you have a story to tell to the nations. A story that shall turn their hearts to the right, a story of truth and mercy, a story of peace and light. For the darkness shall turn to dawning and the dawning to noonday light, and Christ's great kingdom shall come on earth, the kingdom of love and light. Go in strength, go in peace, go with courage to tell your story. Amen.
power of brass 